Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We've finally left all the stars behind, and now we're going out and looking at the entire universe as a whole. So this begins the series of lectures on galaxies, the larger universe, and the Big Bang, the origin and fate of the universe. So let's start off with a cosmic address. And first we're going to define what we mean by the concept of cosmology, which is what we're going to be talking about for the next bunch of things. Cosmology is an area of physics, it's an area of astronomy, but it's its own separate thing, and it's the study of the entire universe as a whole. So we're looking at all the physics of the entire universe, how things are distributed on all size scales, how things move about inside the universe, such as galaxies and space and time itself, and how the universe itself evolves with time. And then we're going to be talking about, finally, as we go through this long series of lectures, the age, origin, and fate of the universe. And that's what cosmology is a study of. Most of the things that we're going to be talking about which are called Big Bang cosmology, because the Big Bang is the current paradigm for the way we think about how the universe is arranged. And there's four big pieces that are associated with the Big Bang, and I'll call it, start with number zero, which is an underlying assumption. And the underlying assumption to everything is that the universe on the largest size scales is homogeneous and isotropic. And homogeneous means it doesn't matter where you go anywhere in the universe, you're going to have roughly the same stuff around you. And isotropic means that no matter where you go in the universe, you're going to see roughly the same things in every direction. And those are two different terms. They have, a, they have different meanings when you think about it, but we'll talk that in greater depth later. The next thing that is a cornerstone of the Big Bang is the cosmic redshift, which is the fact that all galaxies appear to be rushing away from us. The farther they are, the faster they're rushing away. And next one is the cosmic microwave background, which is a prediction of a hot early universe. And third is the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, where elements are created inside of the earliest moments in the cosmos. And last is galactic evolution, is just seeing how things change. Because if the universe had a birthday, then it was different ago than it is today. And so therefore we should expect to see that if we, we should have observational um, results that show us that galaxies actually change with time. And so these, these four things, with one underlying assumption, give us what we call Big Bang cosmology. Our first important thing that we're going to be looking at for the, that relates to that number zero is called the cosmological principle, and that there's really nothing special about any place in our location of the universe except for the fact that it's our place and it's our home. That's the only real special thing. And uh, basically, if you went anywhere else in some other galaxy, you might be in where there's many more galaxies or many more stars or something like that. But the underlying idea of the cosmological principle is that the laws of physics are the same everywhere in the entire universe. That's what the cosmological principle really means. So that's a, it's a very fascinating assumption, and it's a principle that is borne out by observations. All right. The cosmological principle implies that isotropy, meaning looking the same in any direction that you look, around any one point in the universe, combined with this cosmological principle, means that it's isotropic everywhere. Homogeneous everywhere means it's the same stuff no matter where you go. Homogeneous everywhere would mean that no matter where you were in the entire universe, you would see roughly what you do no matter where you looked. So we don't live in a special vantage place. We don't live in some place that's over on the left-hand side up against the dance hall where everybody with the wallflowers, and we don't live in big downtown universe where everything was born and goes out from there. No, we live in just a typical downtown sort of uptown sort of rural galaxy somewhere out in space, and we just happen to be where we are. That's it. That's a cosmological principle. So let's take this idea and give us our cosmic map and see where we actually get from that. But let's just go take a look. Here's the Earth. The Earth is our starting point, our first starting point in the cosmic address. And the Earth is a planet orbiting the sun. And yes, the Earth is actually round. Don't worry about those people that say it's not. They're very, very silly. And so the Earth is one of, of nine planets. I'm going with nine because uh, I knew Clyde Tumbaugh, who was the discoverer of Pluto. And I'm all about that stuff. And I thought the New Horizons mission was really something. So I'm all about Pluto. So I'm going with nine. But there are lots of other objects that orbit the sun other than uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. 
There's a number of dwarf planets, there's zillions of asteroids and comets and things, and the rough size of our solar system diameter is about 50 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, or 50 astronomical units. And Pat, that, that goes out to roughly what we call the Kuiper Belt. Kuiper Belt is roughly where most of the short period comets, meaning some comets that are, that are a few hundred years or less in terms of their orbit around the Sun, that's where they come from. And Neptune and Uranus uh, and other large bodies such as Eris and Haumea actually would disturb these things and cause them to fall into our solar system. So that's our first line from Earth to the solar system. And then we zoom in and look at the sun in the center of this diagram, and we're looking at the nearby stars. One of the nearby stars is Sirius, another is Epsilon Iridani, then Tau Ceti, but the nearest one to our own is Alpha Centauri, actually Proxima Centauri, which we don't see in this diagram because, well, it'll be right next to Alpha Centauri, but just a little bit closer. And it might look like Tau Ceti, or the others are, are the same thing, but we're trying to pretend like this is a three-dimensional map. So many of these stars that we see here are actually kind of bright ones in our night sky. And our solar system is part of the solar interstellar neighborhood, which spans roughly about 50 light years across is a big thing. And you see that these dots that are stars, they, they, fill, they do not fill this place. They look like fireflies in a jar. And that's a pretty good way of analogizing it. However, the problem with this image is that the stars themselves are extraordinarily tiny with respect to their distances. So if we were being truly honest, we would not have any of these stars bigger than a pixel on this image, and we'd have to really zoom in just to see them. They would just be bright points, not disks like we see. Let's take some liberties and, and stick with this. So we're gonna, we'll live with it, it's a, that's okay. But what we can see is that, there's, that, this, that the space around us is not densely packed with stars. So our local solar neighborhood is one of many such neighborhoods in the entire Milky Way galaxy. Now, the Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across and composed of 200 billion plus stars. And so when we zoom out from something 50 light years or 100 light years across to 100,000 or 1,000 times that size, or, or 10,000 times that size, we, get, we see that the, our Milky Way is a vast collection of such stars where the spaces between the stars are incredible. So, but, they, uh, but yet, however, when we look at this size scale, it looks like one fuzzy big object. And that fuzziness comes as a result of the smoothing effect of seeing so many things from such a great distance that they, you can't resolve individual things. So the center of the Milky Way isn't a big ball. It's a series, it's a huge number of stars. And those stars are actually so dense in that region that from viewed very far away, they merge into one thing. But they're not merging. Remember, the distances between stars are incredibly vast. So the Milky Way is made up of huge numbers of stars and gas and dust. So next we say, let's go out further in our cosmic address, and we see the Milky Way galaxy. We zoomed out much further, and we see there's some other little galaxies around it, such as the Large and Small Magellanic Cloud, some other dwarf galaxies, all these little tiny dwarf galaxies, in the local galactic group, which is about 10 million light years in diameter. It's about 3 million light years to the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest large galaxy to our own, with the Triangulum, the M33, and their small spiral galaxy close by. Now we're not looking at individual stars, but each of these galaxies, specifically M31 and the Milky Way, are composed of billions of stars, tens of hundreds of billions of stars. And the Triangulum Galaxy, being a smaller thing, doesn't have as many, but we can see there's incredible gulfs of space between the galaxies. And the Milky Way and Andromeda are falling towards each other and will collide in about 5 billion years or so, long after the Sun has burned out. All right, so we zoom out even further and look at the center of this image as the local galactic group. And the local galactic group is a series of galaxies that are spant, that are part of the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. And so we, now we see groups of galaxies, many large groups with the Virgo cluster off to the right, which is composed of thousands of galaxies. The Fornax cluster down the lower left is also composed of thousands of galaxies. The Virgo cluster is about 65 million light years away from home. And so the light that we see from these distant galaxies left at the time as the dinosaurs were being wiped out by meteorites on Earth. So we're looking at an enormous size scale where the diameter of this area is over 200 million light years. 
and light takes 200 million years to cross this, this vast, vast, vast gulf. But notice there's huge amounts of space, too. There might be some scattered galaxies throughout, but in general, the spaces in between superclusters, in between clusters, are filled with huge amounts of empty space that we call voids. Now we zoom out even further, and we find the Virgo supercluster is just the spur of another very large supercluster of galaxies. Then the local superclusters can be mapped in this way that goes with a diameter of about 2 billion light years. And these are now superclusters of galaxies, which give us hundreds of billions of galaxies. And there is an enormous, enormous, vast area. But notice what we're seeing now is it starts to look kind of cloudy. The superclusters themselves group into filaments and sheets and lines. And those filament sheets, lines, and nodes kind of form the edges of a foamy-like structure, which, is, uh, which are tendrils connecting together. And the reason for this appearance is a result of what we call dark matter. And these superclusters are the places where most of the matter in the cosmos has, has fallen together. And we see that there's enormous voids that can span up to a half a billion light years across, such as the Boötes void and the Capricornus void and the Sculptor void and the Fornax void, all these other major, major voids where there simply are no galaxies in anywhere. And if we look at down the Horologium so cluster, we see part of sorry, another huge supercluster off to the side that leads us to what we call the local superclusters group that we saw in the depth of this. And now we've zoomed out so far that even superclusters themselves look like tiny specks. And so if we imagine a diameter of an area of a volume over 27.5 billion light years in diameter, meaning the light travel time across such a diameter would be 27.5 billion light years. We see that it's now at this size scale, at this distance out, the universe itself looks smooth, meaning we're all, we have smoothed it out so that when you take a bucket of the universe, and that bucket of the universe might be, say, a billion light years across, now the universe looks really smooth, like the static on an old, old, old TV screen that's turned with rabbit ears to some distant, long-lost channel. But this is actually filled with hundreds of billions, if not trillions of galaxies throughout this observable universe. And it begs the question, what's outside this cylindrical area? And the answer is more galaxies. Because remember, the cosmological principle says it doesn't matter where you are. If we're in the center of this particular group, let's say we go all the way to the edge, all the way to what we would see as the edge. And if we went there, well, we would see exactly the same thing that we see around us now. The same kind of thing. Not the same exact clusters, not the same exact galaxies, not the same exact local groups, but the same kinds of things. Other galaxies, groups of galaxies, clusters, just in a different arrangement with different stars, different pretty things in the night sky for the people that live in that distant, distant galaxy. But they would see the same things in general that we do up at that edge. So what about the people's edge for that side off to the right? Well, it just keeps going. So we really think that the observable universe is best we know it. Well, the observable universe is what we can see and what we can possibly see. But the extent of the universe, there's a lot of reasons to think that far beyond the observable universe, there is a place that is much, much, much broader and, and for all intents and purposes is essentially infinite in extent. So that's our cosmic address, and our grand cosmic map is now what we're going to be talking about because we started off talking about the solar neighborhood and the distances to stars and how they live and they're died and how they traverse through the Milky Way and are formed, and now we're going to be talking about how the universe is arranged on the greatest scales of time. All right, this begins our journey into the grand field of cosmology and we're going to be talking about the Milky Way galaxy clusters and all sorts of wild things that happen on the largest size scales. And we'll see you next time.